Hi, everybody. We gather again. So welcome to Fridays at One. I'm Ken Witte. I'm co-chair with Leslie Herman of the Fridays at One committee. And our events are one of the few activities at the Institute for Retired Professionals that welcome outsiders to participate from the new school community, from everywhere in New York City and its suburbs. And if you'd like to find out more about the IRP, you can Google us or go to newschool.edu slash IRP. And the group's been, a, as you all know, a pioneer in peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, since, since it began in 1962. So today, our subject is gerrymandering and an important Supreme Court decision which is imminent. Our speaker is former Indiana Supreme Court Justice Theodore Bohm, an expert on the legal aspects of gerrymandering. Justice Bohm is here thanks to the efforts of our I IRP member, Michael Shapiro, who will introduce him. Michael. Uh, thank you, Ken, and for the efforts of your uh, committee to arrange for this proceeding. I know many in the IRP members are uh, habitual watchers of Rachel Maddow and Anderson <laughs> Cooper, and I hope that today you're going to get a leg up on this whole issue of gerrymandering before the Supreme Court decision comes down, and you'll have some insight when you uh, watch those shows. Uh, Ted Bohm has had a long, significant uh, connection to the gerrymandering issue, going way back when he clerked for Chief Justice Warren at a time when Reynolds versus Sims, uh, the one-person, one-vote requirement for state legislatures was decided. Up to that point, the battle was over unequal population. Since then, it has evolved to gerrymandering, which accomplishes much the same thing as unequal districts 50 years ago. Now, Ted uh, was also the lead lawyer in the case of Davis versus Bandemer, which was the first case where a three-judge court held a map unconstitutional as a gerrymander. And that case went to the Supreme Court where it produced a 4-3-2 decision in 1986 holding a gerrymander claim justiciable but it did not go forward. There wasn't enough justices to provide a remedy. Uh, since then, there, uh, right now, the case of Whitford versus Gill, which was argued in the Supreme Court in October, we are awaiting that decision. Uh, Ted has filed an amicus brief supporting the plaintiffs on behalf of the Center for Media and Democracy, a Madison voting rights organization. A few things about Ted personally, from Indianapolis, graduated from Brown University, summa cum laude from Harvard Law School, 1963, magna cum laude. At Harvard, he was the editor of, and editor of the Harvard Law Review. As I said, after that, he went to the Supreme Court as a law clerk for Chief Justice Warren and retired Justices Stanley Burt Reed and Harold Burton during the 1963 term of the Supreme Court. Later, he went back to Indianapolis, became a partner in a firm, Baker and Daniels, uh, subsequently served as a member of the American Law Institute. And uh, in 1996, he was appointed as a justice of the Indiana Supreme Court by the then Governor Evan Bayh. I didn't know this, that you actually had to run for re-election there, I guess. It's a retention ballot. Uh, Nobody ever lost it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ted was retained uh, uh, in 2008. In 2010, uh, he resigned. He's now a senior judge. And uh, believe it or not, he's uh, back to practicing uh, in a firm in Indianapolis. Uh, he has many civic distinctions, but I'm not going to go through all of them now because we really want to talk about gerrymandering. And I will say that we do, uh, Ted and I do share one uh, distinction in common, and that is we both married uh, very capable, smart women who attended the 
Loomis Chafee School in Windsor, Connecticut, and that's our connection, and that's why Ted is here today. Uh, so I'd like to present to you uh, Justice Ted Bohm. Thanks very much. Am I on the air? Can you hear me in the back? Good. <clears throat> well, um, I, as Michael told you, I have a long and somewhat distinguished career in gerrymandering combating, but only half a loaf. Uh, the case that got to the Supreme Court, and it was the first case to reach the U.S. Supreme Court on this issue, <clears throat> uh, ended up uh, being sort of a, a, a pyrrhic victory at best. Uh, we won the proposition that the courts can entertain the, the uh, claim that a that a gerrymander is unconstitutional, but they couldn't agree on how you, how much is too much is the simplest way to put it. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through that. And let me apologize in the first place to all of you who are not lawyers. It's impossible to get into this without getting into a few legalisms. So if, <clears throat> if any of you have any questions in the course of things, or I use terminology that's not clear, just raise your hand and we, I can try and uh, explain it as we go. Um, but um, first thing, I think it's clear to get a, a, a common vocabulary here. What I mean by a gerrymander is uh, it's, first of all, there are different flavors of gerrymanders. There are partisan gerrymanders. Uh, that is to say, the districts are drawn on purpose to advantage the majority party in control and disadvantage the, the minority in future elections. They're trying to create a bias in future elections. Uh, and the standard techniques, is everybody familiar with the terms packing and cracking? Raise your hands. No. Uh, I see hands, heads going this way and this way. <laughs> packing is basically a very simple concept. The idea is if you're drawing a map from which representatives of any legislative body are going to be elected, you want to put as many of the opposing minority party's voters into the same district as you can. Ideally, you'd get a, a district that has, by federal constitutional requirement, to be equal in population with all the other districts. So you want to get the other guys to lose as many votes as they can by spending them on a district they're going to win anyway. Okay? That's packing. Cracking is sort of the flip side of that. If you've got a district that leans a little bit towards the other guy, you want to peel off enough of his votes and stick them into an area that your party has a significant majority in, but you, that you can afford to give up a few votes in that other district to take them away from the majority that the other guy has, okay? And, the, and a, this art is not new, as I'll explain in a few minutes. But just for your, so you understand it, uh, the objective of gerrymanderer is very simple. It's to create a map that'll last until the next census, when the federal constitution requires that the maps be redrawn to balance the population among the districts. That'll, that'll create enough districts that are safe enough to keep them in the majority of the legislative body you're talking about, whether it's a House of the state legislature, either the House or Senate, as you have in New York and almost every other state does, or the United States Congress district. So each state district's its own congressional map, um, and the objective of, of the state legislature there is to create as many safe districts for their congressional candidates as they can. Okay, everybody got that sort of basic? Uh, and just, this is a matter of general agreement that a district that is 55% in favor of one party or another is likely, extremely likely, to remain in, safe for that district for the next 10 years. And the reason is pretty simple. Vote, voters do change. People move in and out of the district. Some people change their minds. But all those things aren't enough to accomplish a 10% a, uh, 10, 10 swing 
from a 55% majority, which means about 20% of the people have to change their votes to, to get from 55 to, to, to 20% of the 55% have to get down uh, to, uh, so you lose the district. So, uh, and there's a lot, an awful lot of analysis that's been done by political scientists and others that demonstrates that that is a, a true proposition, just as a matter of American history, that if you study hundreds of elections, you will find that if you got 55% districts at the start of, a, of, a, of the census, that party is likely to remain in, in power throughout the decade until it's time to gerrymander again and rejigger re your, your uh, calibration. Now, there are bipartisan gerrymanders from time to time. They, they occur in two different ways. One of them is when you have the state legislature divided between the two parties. One party controls the Senate, the other controls the House. They, there are places where the two majority party caucuses have cut a devil's bargain that each of them agrees to let the other's map go through their house uh, so that the one party controls the House delegation, the other party controls the, the Senate delegation. This is essentially an incumbent protection scheme uh, <laughs> it, it, that it, all the people in the two parties agree with each other that they're going to protect their own seats and their own majorities in those houses. And then you do just occasionally get a part of a, a uh, gerrymander that is simply designed uh, <clears throat> to protect incumbents of both parties. But what, what uh, everybody is really upset about is the partisan gerrymander, and that's what I want to talk about now, the one where one party tries to secure control of the legislature throughout the decade by drawing a map that can e accomplish that and keep it in control of the legislature even if it gets less than half the votes, which is exactly what has happened in some of the examples that we're about to talk about. Now, everybody understands that there's something wrong with a gerrymander, uh, in, including, by the way, as you'll see in a moment, the US Supreme Court has said in unanimous decisions, partisan gerrymanders are inconsistent with democratic principles. That's not saying they're unconstitutional. It is saying they're a bad thing, but we're, we'll, uh, we'll get into exactly the nuts and bolts of this in a minute, but it's an important point that there is a basic problem with uh, uh, a gerrymander. And one of the problems that isn't always focused on is it is a classic of a product of conflict of interest because the people who are putting this majority package in place who had the biggest stake in it are the very legislators whose livelihoods and influence and careers depend on keeping those seats and keeping themselves in the majority where they have the committee chairs, where they have the leverage, they have the ability to raise money that other people don't have. So they're securing for themselves a benefit and they're using government power to accomplish that. Now, there, most people say there's something wrong with a law that's designed to help some individuals and not serve some public purpose. But that's exactly what a gerrymander is. It, it's a law that's designed to accomplish some people's private purposes at the expense they're using government power to do that and without any legitimate government, uh, government reason. Now, so that's problem A with them. So it's a misuse of government power in the first place. The, the classic objection to them is it's unfair to the minority party. And of course that's true because you end up as <clears throat> the Indiana uh, people whom I represented 35 years ago now um, w had gotten more votes for the state house and the state senate than the Republican candidates had. Yet they ended up with 43% of the seats uh, out of the election. So it, there's a sort of a basic disconnect between what the voters want and what the voters get out of an election that's been gerrymandered. But there are other problems that aren't as, as 
severely or as, as widely discussed that are very important. One of them is the effect of a gerrymander is to put the selection of the candidate who's going to win in the fall into the primary election. Whoever carries the primary in a gerrymandered district, a 55% or higher district, is very, very likely to win in the fall, almost assured, and has the ability to raise more money, has all sorts of advantages to secure re-election. The effect of putting the selection of the candidates into the primaries is to disenfranchise independents who don't vote in primaries, in many states anyway. It simply cuts a very large segment of the voting population out of the ability to have a voice in the selection of their representative. Because they, unless they're willing to swear allegiance to one of the parties, and I won't get into this, but the law, state laws vary widely on exactly what it takes to vote in a primary election. Uh, in some states, you can easily float back and forth. Uh, in others, it's a much more complicated and difficult process to vote in the primary of a party with which you haven't already established an affiliation. But there are certainly some people, and there's a lot of study of this too, who as a matter of principle won't vote in a primary election because they don't want to declare support for a political party. They basically take the position that a plague on both your houses, the, all these party organizations are somewhat uh, distasteful, is one way to put it. And this is a matter of principle, don't want to vote in a primary. And those people, as a result of a gerrymander, get no vote at all. Now, the consequence of that is the, the third level of problems. You've got the sort of moral problems that, the, that it's inequitable. You've got the political problem that it disenfranchises in, independence. But then you have the, the, what you will, if you will, the political consequences of this. The, because the primary is the only significant event in the selection of a, let's call it a congressional candidate, it, it can, same applies in the state houses, uh, races as well. Because the primary is the only significant event in, in determining who that person is going to be, the primary candidates run to the center of gravity of their political party, not of the voters as a whole. So if you think of the distribution of public opinion from, from your point of view, left to right, there's some sort of a bell curve here of, uh, with an awful lot of people in the middle who are somewhere in the moderate range or, or at least are more uh, inclined to compromise, uh, to work things out in, 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 and let the country go forward. The bell curve of people in each of the two parties, here's your, here's your bell curve <laughs> of the general public, here's your bell curve of, on the right, Republicans, and here's your bell curve of Democrats. There is an overlap, I mean, they, they but the point is the two candidates run essentially there rather than there. And the result of that is you have very few centrists or moderates in the legislative body that's selected there. You end up with the classic complaint we now have today about most of our legislative bodies, including the United States Congress, that it's polarized, that it doesn't reflect the opinion of the general body politic, it reflects whatever can come out of the central uh, center of gravity of the two political parties. Uh, so uh, the, the, the bottom line is you end up with the extremes of political opinion being overrepresented and the center being underrepresented. And the general election is a meaningless event. It's already been decided. This shows up particularly in the voter turnouts in the uneven or the non-presidential years where voter turnouts often tend to be much lower, particularly if there's no one running for the United States Senate in that seat. 
If you don't have a presidential candidate, you don't have a U.S. Senate candidate. The only seats are legislative candidates, and the legislative candidates are all in races that have been decided in the primary already. You have very low voter turnout, very little interest in the election. So you have voter apathy. You have a less interested, less well-informed electorate uh, and uh, uncontested districts. As many as the third to 40 percent of the districts of the races are uncontested in many states. Simply nobody, the minority party doesn't even bother to field a candidate. Uh, so as long as the successful candidate votes for him or herself, he's got a guaranteed win in the primary and then he wins in the in the general election through the weight of the gerrymandered district. Now, there's nothing new about this. This is the original gerrymander. The term comes from Elbridge Gerry. It's, it should be gerrymander, <laughs> purists tell you, but everybody calls it gerrymander, and so do I. Uh, but Governor Ger Elbridge Gerry was governor of Massachusetts at the time of the 1812 election in which the term gerrymander was, was designed. So th there is nothing novel about j rigging, rigging max, maps to produce districts that favor one party or another. What is new about it, uh, and, and by the way, the characteristic that the original complaint about gerrymanders was the districts were were irregular and unfamiliar, and this this gerrymander. Can, did you see my little purse? Yeah, the, the, these feet and the and the, um, uh, the the head on the gerrymander were the creature of the cartoonists. But the the rest of this is actually what the map of the Massachusetts district looked like. More here's Boston in the middle with uh, with all these districts jiggering around in irregular shapes. So you end up with districts that are both irregular and unfamiliar. Uh, this is my favorite irregular map. This is a congressional districts that the Democrats drew in when they were in charge of California after the 20. I mean, this one <laughs> stretches miles across California and, and connects through little bridges of, of area population districts that were designed to assemble the right result. Uh, the, the, this is both somewhat amusing and entertaining, <laughs> but it, it also has significant negative effects. Voters don't know who their district is when these lines have no relationship to the lines that they're familiar with. They, they don't correlate to city and township lines or school district lines or natural boundaries like major rivers or interstate uh, highways that divide communities, all those things that the, er, the general populace understands and identifies with, and so that they know they're in Senator so-and-so's district or not, in the state, in the case of a state senator, uh, are, are wiped out by the typical gerrymander that simply crosses these lines willy-nilly uh, to advantage, to, to, to capture the right vote for their party or to split the vote for the opposing party. Uh, and then there's some, another more complicated problem that some districts that have a natural af affinity and should be have a, a major voice in the state legislature don't get one. Uh, this is a map of uh, my hometown, Indianapolis, Indiana. The red line is the boundaries of the city of Indianapolis, which, as you see, is a square. It's coterminous with the county, Marion County, in which it sits. It has about 15 percent of the population of the state, which would give it approximately eight senators in the Indiana State Senate. But of the eight districts that you that you that embrace Marion County, we have number 31 up here that takes a chunk of suburban Republican Marion uh, Hamilton County. District 30 does the same. District 29 does the same. District 35 reaches out into Hendricks County, another suburban Republican County. District 36 reaches out. And only 32 
in 34 of all these districts, uh, this one also reached, uh, are wholly in Marion County and represent the city of Indianapolis alone, as opposed to being selected by uh, populations that reach, include significant parts of the surrounding <laughs> suburban area. And pro not uncoincidentally, the people who have been elected from most of these districts that embrace the surrounding areas are, actually live in those surrounding areas and are not a voice for Marion County, which has a number of unique interests in the state legislature every year that has due to its um, situation as the state capital and by far the largest city in the state with a number of laws that apply only to it. Yet it has a, a minimal voice in how those laws get passed. Uh, that situation exists all over the country in various forms. I don't know anything about New York in, in the detail. I can't speak to it at all, so don't ask me about it. Uh, but it's, it, I can tell you from my knowledge of several Midwestern states, there's nothing unusual about that situation. Now, who's in charge of drawing these lines? Uh, the state legislature does it in 45 states. There is, uh, in five states, a bipartisan, which means it's split evenly between the two parties, or a nonpartisan, which means it's a truly neutral, composed of people who are not politicians as such at all, or political appointees, a commission that draws the lines. And um, how did those five states get that kind of a system, which if you want an editorial opinion, generally works pretty well in most states. Uh, you end up uh, with these commissions being nominated by and by statute required to be people who essentially promise that they're not going to draw the lines based on political outcomes. They may even disregard the, the uh, voting date history of the uh, populations entirely in drawing the lines and rely solely on making them essentially regular in shape and, and adhere to existing lines that have some independent significance like county and township lines and so on that we've already talked about. Uh, but uh, in, in, in most states, the state legislature has the ability to draw both the congressional maps and the uh, state legislative maps. And so the question is, how are we going to fix this? One obvious answer is the state legislatures could fix it themselves. They could either require maps to be drawn without regard to political data, or they could delegate it to some neutral body to draw a map. In, in, in a case I'm going to tell you about in a minute, that can be a law, pro law professor who will draw it uh, under some guidelines. There are a variety of ways you can end up with a neutral map that is not biased in favor of one party or another. But as the lawyer who represented the plaintiffs in a case uh, j that was just argued in the Supreme Court last month, uh, politicians like gerrymanders. And the, the prospect of getting this fixed through the state legislatures appears to be essentially zero in almost every state. You can get a voter initiative in some states, and that's how California and Arizona uh, got the bipartisan or nonpartisan commissions that they have to draw their maps. Uh, just as an, as an item of getting a little bit into the legal weeds here, the U.S. Constitution does say that the, quote, legislature sets the times, place, and manners of elections uh, uh, for the congressional districts. Uh, the question whether uh, that precluded a bipartisan commission uh, was in the U.S. Supreme Court a couple of years ago. Uh, and the answer is, uh, this is the name of the case, uh, the Arizona legislature, when the uh, voters went over their heads and invoked a procedure that doesn't exist in many states, where voters can, by petition, put a law on the books, and, if it's, and then if it gets a certain vote in a general election, uh, 
it becomes a law, just like a law passed by the state legislature uh, by operation of the state constitution that permits that. Um, and that's what happened in California, or, excuse me, in Arizona. And the Arizona legislature, undeterred by the fact that the voters had themselves put this procedure in place, sued to have it held invalid under this provision. Uh, and the, it went to the Supreme Court, which only by five to four said, well, no, the legislature means the lawmaking body under the state constitution, whatever that is. And if the state constitution says the voters can pass a law directly without going through a, quote, legislative body the way many people understand it and the way it was understood at the time that the Constitution was framed in 1787 because there just wasn't a voter initiative in any state at that time. But if the, the Supreme Court says, that's OK, you can have a bipartisan commission. But that leaves us in almost every state with a court challenge. And that gets us to the, um, the history. The, the first case was the one that I was involved with in, in Indiana in 86. In subsequently in Pennsylvania in, in 2004, and now in Wisconsin and North Carolina, we, and uh, a state court in Pennsylvania, we've got cases, and Maryland, excuse me, uh, as well. Uh, all in the Supreme Court now, except the Pennsylvania case where the U.S. Supreme Court has said that's a decision under the state constitution, the Pennsylvania state constitution, and the Supreme Court's not going to touch it. So that, the, the map, that's, the election that's going to take place in 2018, unless something dramatic happens that isn't foreseeable at this point, will be on a map ordered by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court under the state constitution, and it will undo a gerrymander uh, of the Pennsylvania districts. All right, uh, I'm giving, throwing a lot at you here. Please feel free to <laughs> ask questions if you want, if you prefer. The cases that went up are the ones that I've handled in first, and then the, the Veith case from Pennsylvania set the stage for where we are today. And I think I'm running a little long, so I'm going to spin through some of this rapidly. Uh, the net result uh, of all this is it was on the question first, can the courts entertain a gerrymander? The, the legal term for that is a justiciable. That's lawyer speak for simply means, can the courts do anything about it? Or is this something? like the power to, to declare war that the Constitution gives to another branch of government and the courts can't deal with it. The, the, that is still being debated today in the US Supreme Court. The, the proponents of the it's not justiciable position are still maintaining that today and arguing it in the Wisconsin and, and Maryland cases. Uh, that are before the U.S. Supreme Court that I'm going to tell you about in a second. But the net result on the, on the justiciability question, I think, is the answer, given the composition of the Supreme Court today, is yes. That Justice Kennedy has aligned himself with the four sometimes called liberal justices on that point, and, uh, and that, that you have a five to four majority for the proposition that, yes, the courts can uh, upset a gerrymander. And this, again, gets back to the point I've already adhered to, or uh, alluded to, that the, uh, a, majest a majority, including Justice Kennedy, said that, the, uh, that a partisan gerrymander is incompatible with democratic principles. That same quote was later repeated by a unanimous court in another context uh, that came up in the 2016 term. Um, but here's the, here's the rub. The, the big question is, how do you decide too much? Or, uh, it's too much as opposed to not enough. In the Bandemer case that I handled, the, the four-justice plurality uh, 
there weren't five justices for anything, but four justices said, well, we can entertain this, but you've only proved that you had one election in which the Democrats got 52% of the vote, but only 43% of the seats, and, and one election isn't enough. That's what the four said. Two justices agreed with us that we had proved enough with this, with all the irregular shapes and all the proof about how the map was drawn in secrecy by, uh, and without any input from anybody, but a few party leaders and things that made it clearly a partisan effort. Uh, that that was good enough. And three justices at that time said it's not justiciable. We now have, since then, Justice Scalia joined the court and has been succeeded by Gorsuch, both of whom appear to be in the it's not justiciable camp, but that still leaves Kennedy plus the four uh, for the proposition that, it, that the court can deal with it. And what, every, what everybody signed on to, including Kennedy himself, was Justice Kennedy found no standard workable, but left open the opportunity uh, that one might be developed in the future. So that gets us to the question, well, what is that standard? Uh, the, uh, just fine, I can't resist telling you this. The Arizona legislature didn't give up, having lost this case trying to challenge the voters' right to override them. They then came back and said, oh, the map that the bipartisan commission drew itself violated the population requirements of the, of the federal constitution. Mr. Harris is, in, is affiliated with the uh, legislative majority in the uh, Arizona legislature. Uh, and Justice Breyer, writing for a unanimous court, again wrote, this is yet another quote from recent Supreme Court, assuming without deciding that partisanship is an illegitimate, plaintiffs failed to show it. Uh, so uh, that's a little different from saying it's incompatible with uh, democratic principles. That's coming closer to saying, assuming it's, uh, it's an, in, an illegitimate redistricting factor gets closer to saying it might be unconstitutional. But they're only nudging up to this. They haven't addressed it squarely. <laughs> and um, now we've got three cases up there. Gill versus Whitford, which it deals with the Wisconsin State House map. And in Wisconsin, the state Senate districts are composed of three state House districts. Those districts are what people call nested, in other words, the, uh, the, the same three House districts themselves make up one Senate district. So you have a 99 person, it has to be something that divides by three, obviously. You can't have a 100 person legislature with that system. You have to have something that uh, a mathematician would say is mod three. And, uh, and uh, that's what they've got. So that's the, the Wisconsin case. The Maryland case doesn't challenge the state map in Maryland. It challenges the way the Democratic majority in the state legislature in Maryland drew, redrew the maps after the 2010 census to take the two out of eight districts, uh, uh, districts that the Republicans had on the old map and jam all the Republicans in those two districts into one district, leaving it a, a seven to one state instead of a six to two state. Uh, and then in North Carolina, it attacks the North Carolina congressional maps as a whole uh, under a theory that's very similar to the one we advanced in uh, the Bandenberg case from Indiana 35 years before. All these cases are now in the Supreme Court in one form or another raising the basic question of what a plaintiff must prove. And as I've already walked you through, uh, the, the Indiana case produced uh, the one election isn't enough rule uh, out of the plurality. It's not a majority rule, but at least that's what they said. And then in the Pennsylvania case, Justice Kennedy for the first time introduced the notion, and pardon me, I'm gonna get a little bit lawyer-like on you here, <laughs> 
for the first time said this might be a First Amendment freedom of expression, freedom of political association issue, not just an equal protection issue, that it's unfair to Democrats versus Republicans, that the equal protection clause that is the clause in the Constitution that was placed there after the Civil War that, for, among other things, required governments to treat all citizens the same unless there's some legitimate government reason to treat them differently in, in sort of lay terms. Now, that, ter that principle applies to gerrymandering just as much as it applies to any other action that a state takes, any other law that a state uh, passes, whether it's a racially discriminatory law or an age discriminatory law or all sorts of other classifications uh, can be challenged under that a broad equal protection principle. But the, Kennedy, for the first time, comes up with the idea that maybe this is really a problem under the First Amendment, which guarantees the right of association of people. That's what lets people form political parties, for example. And you have a right to do that, to get together with other people to express your opinions. And if this uh, law operates uh, as, a, as a burden on the minority party's rights of association, it may violate the First Amendment not as well as the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, and in support of that proposition, Justice Kennedy noted that we had already had laws on the books that say that political parties can't be targeted by governments, even going back to cases dealing with the Communist Party in the 50s, uh, and patronage cases where the government uh, can't use its job hiring ability in a way to discriminate against people uh, because of their political beliefs. Uh, and so the, Kennedy announces that the First Amendment does protect representational rights, whatever that now turns out to mean. Uh, and um, it, Kennedy says, and this is where we really get down to the key that everybody's struggling with today. He says, and, and he is critical because the other four are going to go with whatever he wants to go with, most observers think, uh, that you need to measure the effect of the apportionment, that is to say, the way the districts are configured, to conclude that the state did impose a burden on people. So, so now, how do we measure it? And uh, it, it, once again, this is a, a quote by uh, Kennedy in a case that came up two years later from Texas, uh, talking about a burden on representational rights as measured by a reliable standard. So what does that mean? Searching for standards. The first proposal is the efficiency gap. This was an invention of a law professor at Ch University of Chicago <clears throat> named Nicholas Stephanopoulos. I, I don't know if he's related to George Stephanopoulos <laughs> in, 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 or not. He may be. Um, I met Nick, but I didn't I have the temerity to ask him. I should have. Um, he, he, uh, his, this is, in my view, a, quite a clever idea. He says, what you want to do is measure what the gerrymanderer is trying to accomplish. And it goes back to the packing and cracking point. And he says, well, it's easy to measure the packing and cracking effect of a map. All you need to do is look at how many votes of the two parties are wasted. And a wasted vote means every vote for the party that wins above one above 50%. So if it takes 50 votes to, 51 votes to win this district, anything above 51 is unnecessary. And all votes for losing candidates are, quote, wasted. In other words, a wasted vote is a vote who, if those people had stayed home at the election, on election day, the result would have been exactly the same. You'd had the same people elected. Uh, as if those people had all died on the way to the polls, okay? Uh, and, and this is the key, 
this is where the political scientists come in. The, we now have computers that enable analysis that simply couldn't have been done at the time uh, we were pushing the Indiana case uh, in 1982. Uh, the, the computing power didn't exist and the data didn't exist to, to do the com computation, even if you had the computers. But now it does. And people, uh, professors have run analyses of hundreds of elections and come up with the following proposition. If you have a map in which it has a 7% efficiency gap or more, it gives a 95% probability that that, that that majority party will continue to perpetuate its majority for the next 10 years until the next election. And that's simply based on a lot of analyses of historical elections. It's not a, a theory at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a proposition based on historical fact, as people have behaved that way uh, in the past 30 years. Uh, now, the, the a leading candidate for that theory is how do you measure it, is so-called partisan symmetry. This is, this test is, each party would get the same number of seats from the same percentage of votes. An example, if 60% of the votes would give Democrats 70% of the seats in that state, then 60% of the votes for the GOP would give the GOP 70% of the seats. And, and it, the way elections work in districts, this is simply a matter of the fact that people tend to vote in, in waves or in, in, in parallel, more or less off across the country and certainly in, this, in, in a given state or region. If, if, if there's a shift, shift of 4% in favor of one party in, in a District A and District B is next to it, there's going to be about a 4% shift in, in B too. In other words, and it may be a 10% shift some years where they have what's called a wave election, where you do get a big change in party preferences. But that doesn't happen in isolated pockets. When it happens, and again, this is just a matter of people who study elections, it happens across the, the country and certainly in, in identifiable patterns within regional areas and so on. Uh, so if you get 60% of the votes, you're actually going to get way over 60% of the seats. That's just the fact that the same getting over 50% is operating across the state and you're going to get even more uh, leverage than simply 60%. You're going to get, and, and at some point that peaks out because by the time, if you get 70% of the vote, you're probably going to get close to 100% of the seats <laughs> because there are uh, okay, you got the math. Uh, uh, and uh, then there's a, the, the mean median ratio, which is one that mathematicians like, which is simply another way, sort of, to measure the efficiency gap. Um, and with that, uh, these cases are all there, and the question is, how is it going? The cases have been argued and I am running longer than I should, and it's time to stop for questions. I'll be glad to give you some speculation if you want it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. I have a question. If of the 50 states, uh, five states have nonpartisan redistricting groups. Have they measured the results of elections from the five nonpartisan redistricting groups compared to the 45? And presumably, if the nonpartisan redistricting uh, setups are working properly, if uh, the Democrats get 60% of the vote, then you get something like 60. I know you said something like 70. I think the proper answer would be if they get 60% of the vote in the state, it would be nice if 60% of the legislature would be Democrat, but you think it might be a little more. But whatever the right answer is, I just love the, the answer for those five compared to the 45. Uh, the, the short answer is we don't have much data yet because these are relatively new. Uh, Iowa has had a bipartisan commission for a long time. <clears throat> and one of the problems with Iowa as a, 
an exemplar for the nation is Iowa is a relatively homogenous state. Uh, most of its districts look pretty much in demographic terms like all its other districts. And, and you don't have the phenomenon that m many states do, certainly New York is a, a classic example, where there are extreme concentrations in, in some parts of the, of the state and very high concentration of voters uh, who are favorable to one party or another in different parts of the state. And that, so that can, that, those concentrations make your, if you get 60% of, of the vote, you ought to get 60% of the seat, there's no way you'd get that in a, in a, on a U.S. map for the most part. Uh, and and that's, that's a European system is what it is. I mean, you know, a, a parliament, parliamentary system, so-called proportional representation, which is simply not ever going to come to in in our lifetimes in place in the United States. Yeah, uh, I want to ask you a question about the the, the standards because I noticed that uh, all of the standards that you've discussed and uh, the ones that are in in the courts have to do with results or pers actual results or prospective results using whatever formula you you want to choose. Is there any any arguments based upon uh, the methodology actually used to draw the lines? In other words, the the, in, the intent based upon the methodology? Absolutely. I, all these uh, I, I skipped over that because I've already get as you see I can get pretty long winded on this subject. Uh, it, 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 I think most people would say that a critical proof. Is, has, it is that the map was drawn for a partisan purpose in terms of how it got passed. Did it get passed by a, by a partisan vote over the opposition of the minority party? Did it get drawn in secret so that it, it, it wasn't unveiled until the end of the legislative session? Things like that uh, are a, a component of proof of you've got that you have a partisan gerrymander as opposed to you could have a map that is drawn by a bipartisan commission that would show a big efficiency gap. Uh, and that would be simply the result of the fact that uh, of, of the population distributions of, this, of the state. And in which event, I think most people would say you don't have an unconstitutional map. You've got to tell the voters they've got to go live somewhere else if they want to. What is your estimate? Uh, sorry. I, what do term limits do to gerrymandering? Uh, nothing. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, we don't have a lot of experience with term limits that have been in, in place in any legislative body, as, uh, to my knowledge, for a long time. Uh, but <clears throat> it is, as long as you have a the will to preserve uh, you're going to have a, a significant body of people if you say you can't survive more than two Senate terms or for six years each, so 12 years is the longest. I don't think many people would advocate a, a, an immediate, uh, a, a one-term requirement uh, you're, uh, for, for lots of reasons if you want to get, I don't know if we have time to argue that, but you, it, assuming you want some experience in the legislative body, and don't want to just turn over the government to the legislative staffs that, <laughs> that would be the practical effect of, of very short term limits. Um, you, you, you're going to have incumbents who, who, will, who will have an interest in keeping their positions. Um, it might help some, but it's, it's certainly not a fix. What is your uh, estimate? Uh, which is uh, destroying democracy more at this point, <laughs> Citizens United or gerrymandering? I, I've got a speech on <laughs> Citizens United if you want. I, 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 they're both horrific results. Uh, and I, I, the, the, the only thing I would say to you is that I think the one thing that can be done that will have the most effect is getting rid of gerrymandering because that has at least some prospect of being accomplished. 
gerrymand getting rid of citizens finance with the current composition of the supreme court appears to be not a not on the horizon for at least a very long time and um unfortunate but that's um, just worried about. i hope i'm wrong about that yes can you share with us what arguments the conservative justices present in defense of what they the position they take the main mm -hmm. argument is uh the, the most important one uh is that this is not something the courts should be dealing with it's inherently a political uh, decision and that any decision they would make would be uh, the product of the political preferences of the Supreme Court as it exists from time to time and not the result of any reasoned uh, adjudicatory function. Judges are supposed to decide the law, not make it. They're supposed to apply rules, not their own preferences. And uh, the, it, there is no principled rule by which you can decide this case. It's it's simply going to be a matter of who who, have, who the justices happen to be, and you can make a decent argument that that's supported by the way this current Supreme Court breaks out on that. On on the other hand, and you can make an argument that the decision in the in the Vandemer case, the Indiana case 35 years ago, was driven by political considerations because even though we made what I considered to be and still do a pretty powerful argument that under the Equal Protection Clause, we'd established, first of all, that this was a law passed purely for partisan purposes with all the uh, secrecy and, and computer adjusted. Roger Ailes, by the way, was the, his consulting firm was the people that drew the maps in Indiana with a, really the first consulting, first computer driven uh, gerrymandered, I believe. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. It, it, <laughs> I love talking about Roger Ailes. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the conservative position. Oh, oh it, it, that, um, that in, 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 in the Indiana case, Justices Brennan and Marshall, the two most liberal justices, voted against us. And the re, one explanation for that is it would have helped the Republicans more than the Democrats nationally if we won that case. Because California, for example, was a classic gerrymander in favor of the Democrats, and it carried a lot more congressional seats than Indiana does. That, yeah. that is a, a, um, a, 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 a you can, you, there is some data to support that. that yeah, um, my name's Ted. Uh, I'd like to change the little, the subject a little bit. I mean, I agree with what you, everything that you've said, and that the legal aspects are very, very important, but I think it's a matter of question of political will, and that you haven't spoken in, into a larger context of what this is all about. And to me, it's all about um, a right-wing attempt to take over the country, and it started out with the Koch brothers with money. So the Citizens United is incredibly important. And also in North Carolina, if you, if you read the briefs, you'd see that, it, that the history of racism in this country is so clear that nor in North Carolina, they even stated very clearly that they're doing it uh, before on black and white and racist issues. My point being that if we're going to change this, and we are so, so needing to change it, it has to do with political will, organization, and trying to, not just putting it into a legal framework, but putting it into a political framework. And if we don't do that, we're in a way, I mean, I don't want to go on and on, but in a way, you, it's a statement. And I'm asking his comment. And if you don't go, if you don't put it that political will, and you don't put it in a context of history, American history, you're going to lose the, you're going to lose the issue, and you're going to lose the fight. Can you comment on that? Well, I, I'm sympathetic to the point you make. <clears throat> I, I guess I'm ultimately a pragmatist and think that the only real hope we have, in the short term at least, is in these court cases. That maybe over time the public will get sufficiently upset about this. Uh, but th th there's no prospect at, at, in most state legislatures uh, 
that they're that they're under any pressure at all and the general public has shown no interest in this issue and 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 if the only way you're going to overcome uh, the the money side of it is with a grassroots effort where you just get people thousands and thousands and thousands of them to to demand that their legislator their state legislator take a pledge like Grover Norcrest demands of tax on tax relief uh, that if you don't vote for this, we're going to vote you out and get a mass campaign going. Attempts to do anything like that have not even come, shown any prospect of, of working. In the back there? Um, a few minutes ago, you said something about your speculations. I think you, you said something about your speculations about what's going to happen next. Oh. Would you like to uh, pursue that? Well, I, I was more optimistic two months ago than I am today because of the, the arguments that have now been held in the, in the court. Uh, it appears that the court is really struggling uh, to find uh, something that satisfies the measurable standard. Uh, and some of the justices clearly, I mean, just, Chief Justice Roberts referred to some of these uh, tests as gobbledygook. I, I don't think that's quite a fair description uh, at all because, I, as I said, I think that the efficiency cap really does <clears throat> measure what a, what a gerrymanderer sets out to do, tries to accomplish, and to the point made, you'd clearly have to establish also that the map was drawn for partisan reason and that the efficiency gap isn't the result of just natural selection of uh, or the demographics of the particular area, which it can be. Yes? When you say the efficiency gap, that's something that's objectively determinable because unless you have an objectively determinable standard, you're dealing with essentially a non-justiciable issue. So one of the reasons I mentioned the, uh, what was the result of the nonpartisan five compared to the partisan 45, uh, that would be an objectively possibly determinable standard. You see how the nonpartisan standards work? They're very close to the votes. The votes were 60%, the legislature was 70%. Here in the uh, 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 gerrymandered places, the votes were 50%, but they got 90%. So you, you have to come up with an objectively determinable standard so you can impose a remedy. Well, I think the, the efficiency gap is objectively determinable. That's what's nice about it. it the remedy? Oh, the court says you got to draw. The typical remedy from the court is, and this has happened in a number of cases, where some of election law, typically population re requirements, is that they tell a legislature, draw another map that's cut, that meets constitutional requirements, and if you don't, uh, we're going to draw it for you. And that's what has happened in Pennsylvania in the state. What about the nonpartisan redistricting? Well, it, it, generally, courts are reluctant to order legislatures around any more than they have to. Um, when you discussed Indiana, oh, um, I don't know. But can you hear me? Yes. What? It, I hope I didn't miss this. But the constitutional basis of gerrymandering. I know that Jerry was in 1812. Where is it in the Constitution? Two, 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 two places, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment okay. and the First Amendment Right of Association. So that can be converted in that. Okay, and thank yeah. you for pointing out that my vote doesn't count because I'm an independent in New York. <laughs> yeah. When you talked about your Indiana case... Okay, I'm sorry. When you talked about your Indiana case and they said it wasn't, um, it wasn't a continuing... Decision. So when you talk about um, a means, how many elections do you have to have to show that it's a means? Well, <laughs> you know, if you're talking about a 10 year census, right? How do well, you show it? The, the Indiana, the, the, that, that one election isn't enough right. comment came out of the plurality, not the court's decision. It was only four of the nine justices who signed on to that. <clears throat> and there's no answer to that. Uh, but I in fact, this is just a footnote to that case. By the time it got to the Supreme Court, we also had the 1984 election results in, which confirmed the same thing. Uh, 
that the Democrats had gotten far fewer seats than their, their votes would have required, would have tended to, and the, the, the plurality said, well, that's not in the record of our case. Well, of course, it wasn't in the record of our case because our case was tried after the 82 elect, election, but before the 1984 election in the, in the lower court. Uh, and, so, and the, the dissenting justices, Stevens and Powell, said, well, you can take judicial notice of election results. Those are matters of public record that can be found even if they're not in the record. And the, the plurality didn't say anything about that. So the, the short answer is, I don't think the, the election, re, everybody agrees that election results, a, a number of elections isn't probably a very good remedy because you don't get to the, first you gotta go through a three judge court and then and have a trial and get up to the Supreme Court. And even if you do that on the fastest possible track, you're not gonna get a result until you've had at least two or three elections held under a bad map and there's gotta be a, faster way to resolve these things. You have the mic, you have the mic right? <laughs> All of this uh, is related to the census, which is a very political action, particularly right now. Um, so I'd like to know how it will be decided, whether or not people, the census should include questions of um, what is it? Nationality. Citizenship. Citizenship. Since, uh, in my understanding of the Constitution, you're just supposed to count the people, not the citizens. So um, is this going to go to the same court that may make this terrible decision in terms of the gerrymandering? I mean, how does that get decided? It, it is a question that uh, I believe, if, if you're asking the question about whether the census counts people or counts citizens, that has been resolved and it counts people, as I understand it. Well, it appears to me, based on my reading, that that is not what the president uh, says or, or the suggestion for the present census. I don't think that that's accurate. I, I think it, well, no, 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 that wasn't my point. We will debate that later. Okay, it's a deal. Um, how does this work? You hear me? Uh, um, I, I don't know if this is a fair question to you, but I'll ask anyways. Uh, uh, It would take a constitutional change, and that's why I don't think you'll see it in our lifetimes, because there are many smaller states that are pretty happy with this arrangement. Uh, I mean, if you lived in Delaware, you'd like it, uh, and uh, so it's 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 not something that's on anybody's horizon. I don't think. Um. I just was wondering the the um, using the efficiency gap as a as a standard. Uh, you've got a uh, you've got kind of you have to draw an arbitrary line somewhere. Um, how do how do the proponents of using this uh, propose to get around the idea that you're asking the Supreme Court to essentially draw an arbitrary line? Well, they they they. The, the, the point they make is it's not arbitrary <clears throat> that the, the selection of the 7% is based on historical election data that shows that it's a reliable permanent impairment of the minority party's rights to get appropriate representation. Uh, uh, well, any number is arbitrary, but it, it, it's not arbitrary if it's chosen on a rational basis. And, and uh, <coughs> if, if you can demonstrate, I mean, if you, if you could establish that uh, 
smoking more than two cigarettes a day is, is kills you in three weeks, you could make it illegal to smoke more than two cigarettes. I mean, you can come up with arbitrary, if you can establish the facts that support it, and, and the political scientists, at least some of them, say they have established it simply by election data. Um, but but it, there is a, a direct analogy. There are essentially arbitrary rules of thumb that are imposed on the population cases. Uh, if they, the, the general rule of thumb is that congressional districts have to be within 2% of each other in population uh, and can go up to 10% if there's some legitimate reason like compliance with the Voting Rights Act. Uh, to achieve its the Voting Rights Act requirements, even if it gets bending population requirements. And those numbers are arbitrary, but they are pretty much established by precedent. Ted, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, now, in this case, does it only affect the Wisconsin case, or does it affect all the gerrymandering that goes on around the country? Uh, Technically, it, it, the Wisconsin case would affect only Wisconsin. The Maryland case would affect only Maryland. But as a practical matter, depending on what they say, it could have a nationwide effect. And it would depend in large part on what theory they adopt, if they adopt any. Obviously, if one nationwide effect would be if they say we can't consider this. So <laughs> is this the, the sort federal of, courts are out of the game. So this is the generational case for gerrymandering? It is likely to be, but it may not be. It, it's, the, the, some of the tea leaves suggest that what we may end up with is some sort of curbing of gerrymandering, but not killing it. And if that happens, we'll be in for more rounds of, of uh, litigation. And, and one of the nice things about arbitrary rules is they do tend to settle the, the debate. Uh, and people go on to the next issue <laughs> rather than continuing to relitigate some fuzzy line. So curbing is better than nothing. Uh, I, yes, I guess. Although I, I, we really need to kill it. <laughs> yes, Jen, here. I've read that there's some controversy that at the national level, at the national elections, the gerrymandering doesn't play as big a role as we think. What is your opinion on that? I, I, I've, I've read some of these pieces. They're kind of hard for me to fully digest. Uh, I, I guess I have an opinion that may be based more on personal experience than anything else. But one obvious question is, if the Republicans in Wisconsin didn't think it was worth doing, why did they spend over $200,000 of public money to, to run all these studies as to exactly how much of a wave election could be withstood by this map versus that one? And so, I mean, there, and why, why do majority parties all over the country spend enormous amounts of money getting computer experts to run all these studies, testing, their maps against various election hypotheses uh, if they don't think it makes any difference. Uh, Ted, if I'm correct, um, the Supreme Court has ruled that gerrymandering resulting in racial discrimination is unconstitutional. Correct. What standard do they use in those cases to to reach that conclusion? I'm not an expert on those cases. Uh, yeah, I, as I understand it, and I really, you really should take this, that's a good question, Michael, I'm, I should have. Uh, as I understand it, basically the analysis is you look at the motivation alone, and that's sufficient. Because race is a per se untouchable subject uh, in, <laughs> And, and political discrimination it requires a higher level of proof. Yes, in the back. Hi, uh, thank you. It seems to me that we are back to where we were when we were trying to break away from England, taxation without representation. Uh, is this not an argument? 
uh, <laughs> well, actually, one of the arguments we made, even back in, in the first case, was that this, this is no different from a tax on Democrats uh, that would be plainly unconstitutional. Anybody who votes in a Democratic primary has to pay a tax. And I don't think anybody would say that's a constitutional tax. What's the difference? And no, I've, nobody's ever really given me a good answer to that. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, I don't have to remind this audience that Hillary won by three million votes, and yet we talk piously about one man or one woman and one vote. So that tells us about that, and there's no discussion of the Electoral College. Oh, but my question, I want to zero in on toxicity. You mentioned uh, in Congress the partisanship, and I would like to submit your reaction. Things like Fox News and MSNBC and whatever, technology, intervention from, and also a general absence of knowledge in colleges and universities. I saw millenniums don't know that the Holocaust exists, 27%, 60% don't know where Auschwitz is. And I, that was my field. I spent my life in it. So I'd like you to comment about that because I, gerrymandering has been here since Elbridge was around in 1812. Thank you. No, we're coming. You described before what the conservative judges, what they argue. What do the liberal judges in response argue? What is their position? How do they? Uh, one of the issues has been that they have had different proposals for, uh, as to how to analyze this. Um, and um, I, my view is that if uh, Justice Kennedy can be brought around to anything, that the others will probably be willing to go along with it in the interest of unanimity. That's I could be guessing, and, and it may be that they'll they'll you'll have a whole bunch of different opinions with different analyses. Justice Breyer has a a, a proposal that is somewhat similar to one proposed by Justice Souter before he left the court, uh, which essentially was a sort of a burden shifting approach, similar to what the courts use to establish. Uh, uh, to take example, racial discrimination out of housing patterns, and, and that if you're getting certain statistical results out of a population, that at least the government has to then explain how it gets there, <laughs> or what its, what its legitimate reason is for, for accomplishing this result. And I, that seems like a, a reasonable approach to me. Okay, last question here. In your judgment, what would be the most narrowly tailored remedy that the, <clears throat> that the court could come up with in this case? Well, the, 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 the typical result is to order the state to redraw the map in compliance with whatever requirements the court comes up with. Uh, and then if they don't, the, the, typically the court then does it. Anything short of that would not accomplish much of anything, as far as I can see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ed, thank you, thank you so much. Um, just let everyone know, we'll reassemble September 28th and talk about the crisis of all Western democracy. And <laughs> Ed Luce has written a book about that. He is, he is a Financial Times, the, the chief correspondent in, in Washington, and he'll be with us.